Okay, so we are live on Facebook and I want to welcome the audience out there. And we are doing a chamber chat today with Randall Kennedy. And so we're going to do 30 minutes live on Facebook, then turn that off and um, the audience gets to ask questions. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And <clears throat> the whole purpose of a chamber chat is to kind of learn your journey from where you started to where you are today. And then hopefully we're gonna pick up all these little pearls of wisdom that you have to share with us and we can steal. So anyway, let's get started. And um, where were you born and raised? I was born in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, lived there till I was three and then moved to Charlotte, North Carolina. Lived there till I was in sixth grade and then moved to Atlanta. Okay. And I ended up going through high school in a little town called Sandy Springs, just north of Atlanta. Okay. And how long did you live in Atlanta then? Uh, sixth grade through 12th grade. And then I went to the North, back to North Carolina to go to college. Okay. So <clears throat> and growing up, how many siblings did you have? Two older brothers. Okay. Still alive. Both live in Tampa, Florida. So you're the youngest. Correct. Okay. The unexpected one. The unexpected one. <laughs> okay. They wanted a girl. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting yeah. <laughs> okay and so were there reasons why you moved to different places or well my dad was an executive with the general electric company okay. and he kept getting promoted and transferred and so that he's originally from houston both my brothers were born in houston and then he got transferred to richmond where i was conceived and then um and then he got transferred to Charlotte and then ended up in, in Atlanta. Okay. He ran the Southeast Division for General Electric Supply Company. Okay. So growing up, what's your, your memory, your, the thing that sticks out the most from you know, your early days? I would say, you know, I came from an incredible family. Um, you know, I, I, I've explained it many times that I, I grew up and some of the people in the audience won't know what this is, but it was an Ozzy and Harriet existence. Uh, my mother was a housewife uh, back in that day. And I was born in 1952, so you can do the math. Uh, back in that day, I mean, it was like my dad would come home from work and we would sit down to dinner and he still had his tie on. Mm -hmm. And my mother had a home cooked meal every day. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, my, my family was my core value. Uh, my mother was an absolute saint. As a housewife, she worked harder than anybody I've ever known. She kept an incredible house. Um, plus, she volunteered at the hospital. I mean, we were I was raised Catholic. Um, and my mother went to mass four or five days a week hmm. and worked at the church and did everything. She was tireless. Okay. So any specific lesson, or is that is that the one? Uh, you know, I would say the lesson I learned from my mother was just you give back. I mean, we, I grew up in a very spiritual family mm -hmm. and everything was around spiritual values. And I bet I've heard her say a million times, you need to do what the Lord tells you to do from that book that we read every week. So, you know, everything was about giving back, helping others. She worked at homeless missions and things of that nature. So, you know, my brothers and I witnessed that and we just felt like that's the way we're supposed to do things. And, you know, I, I guess from my dad's perspective, you know, my dad was, uh, he was over everything from Mississippi all the way up to the Carolinas and he had salesmen that worked for him. My dad literally 50 weeks out of the year got in the car on Monday morning and we saw him on Friday night. Wow. But the love that he brought to us for those two days, he never missed a game on the weekends, obviously. But that was the days when it was, you were truly a traveling salesman. He didn't fly to Jackson, Mississippi. He right. drove there and then went to Birmingham, Huntsville on the way and went to his sales offices. That was his existence. But I mean, he was an amazing father, the wisest man. I've ever known, you know, it's like what Mark Twain said, you don't realize how wise you are, that your dad's not stupid till you are one. Um, and that's, that's true. I, I still think about things every day in my life that he imparted upon me. So when you were 
growing up at home, did you have any kind of an idea of what you wanted to do in life as far as a profession? Did you have a dream of, I want to be this or do that? Yeah, I wanted to okay. teach history. Really? Okay. I've got a degree in Civil War history. Okay. Yeah. And then there was a big left turn in my life when I was in, a senior in college. Okay. And that was that, that I graduated in 1974, which was the height of the Carter recession. Mm -hmm. uh, you literally could not get jobs anywhere. I mean, you would go to the library and for those of you who remember, uh, they used to have the wooden racks with all the newspapers from all over the country. And you would go to the Wan ads in the New York Times, Chicago Sun Times, Los Angeles, whatever. And there would literally not be a Wan ad section. The one newspaper that had them was the Dallas Morning News. Hmm. So I packed up my Toyota Corolla and came out to Texas. And there were a lot of ads for banks <clears throat> meeting people, particularly in real estate. Right. And I thought, well, you know, what the heck? I've got to eat. So I went to work. <laughs> I went to work for a bank in Dallas uh, in 1975. And I thought I'd work for four or five years. Then I'd go back to North Carolina, which is a place I was near and dear to my heart. Right. And I would teach history for the rest of my life. 47 years later, I'm retiring from the bank on Chick. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So tell me about your passion for uh, history. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I, I just, when I was a little boy, we had a set of world books. Okay. Anybody remember world books? Yeah. And I would sit in our living room floor and read page after page after page. I absolutely love history. I, I mean, I, I read probably 30 or 40 books a year and every one of them is a historical history. book. Yeah. I, Brian Atkinson, for those of you who know Brian Atkinson, he and I are big history buffs and we trade books back and forth. And he just gave me a book yesterday. It's a brand new book uh, on Stonewall Jackson, who's one of my heroes. Has nothing to do with the cancel culture or anything, folks. I just, you know, as a Civil War history yeah. guy, I study Civil War history. And so I'm looking forward to reading that 800 page book. Wow. <laughs> he had a long life. Started out as a history professor at uh, BMI. Ah. There's your connection to him. Okay. Well, actually, I'm a Civil War history, but my senior year in college, I took, you know, advanced studies in Civil War history, and I had one of my greatest professors, was a guy named John Robbins, who's since passed. Um, he was brilliant, and we literally camped out on every battlefield. And, really? and stayed the entire time during the duration of the battle and went through the sequences of the battle. And three days at Gettysburg is a long time, I'll tell you. But that's it. I mean, I love history. I've always loved history. Uh, you know. Do you think that, um, do you look at history from the perspective of what it can teach us today? Do you do the parallel? Or is it? Those who forget it are doomed to repeat it. That's right. And we repeat it. Uh, and don't please don't get me talking about what's going on in the world today because that's a hot button for yeah. me. We've, we've done it before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Okay. So tell me about the bank. Tell me about, about your, your career in banking. Uh, you know, I started out with a bank in Dallas. It was a bank that was owned by Bum Bright, who owned the Cowboys at one point in time. Um, and I worked there for a while and you know, back in those days, there was a lot of camaraderie among bankers. There was a bankers. Actually, what we like to do is get together and drink after work on, uh, <laughs> under the guise of, you know, some bankers association or whatever. Right. And there was a group in Dallas, but there was also a group in Arlington. And so I was do I was in, I got into real estate early on because that was the big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to think of that period in the mid seventies is the great migration into Texas. Mm -hmm. I lived, my first apartment was in the village apartments over in Dallas. And, you know, you knew it. <laughs> You go out to the pools on Saturday and there'd be hundreds of kids out there. Literally every one of them from, were from out of state because everybody was moving here for the same reason I did. There were just no jobs yeah. anywhere. So we went from probably in the 60s, literally everybody lived in Texas was a native Texan to probably it watered it down to about 50-50 to where now it's even less than that, I would think. 
So um, I came out to Arlington and started, uh, I was doing a lot of real estate activity out here. And so I started going with some of these organizations out here. And one of the fellows I met was the head of the real estate department at what was then Arlington Bank and Trust, which became Texas Commerce Bank, which is now Chase Bank in downtown Arlington. And so they hired me away and I went to work there and I worked there for 13 years running the real estate department. Did a tremendous amount of development down here for, remember Tom Corbin, D? Uh, for Tom Corbin at Kent Gatiss, did a lot of the development behind the country club. Um, and so then I stayed there for 13 years and we hit the mid eighties, which was, if you were in the real estate lending business, it was not a fun time. I always like to tell people that, you know, I develop relationships with my customers and they become my very good friends. And in a snap of a finger, it went from them sitting on this side of the table to them sitting on that side of the table with their attorney sitting next to them. And it was called lender liability and everybody was suing the banks for getting them in the hole that they got into that themselves. Got yeah. So, you know, that, that, kind of soured me for a period of time on being a specialist in real estate because we went through three or four years where, I mean, it was, I'm, I mean, I can tell you every night I went home and my wife said, you got to get out of this mess. You were miserable. And because these were my friends and I was being sued by them and they were being sued by me. I went to more depositions than you can possibly imagine during that period of time. And so I just said, I've got to get, if I'm going to stay in banking, I've got to get more diversified. And so that's when a guy named Monty Goddard yeah. called me, one of my dearest, dearest friends, God rest his soul. Uh, he called me one day out of the blue and said, hey, I'm with a bank in Fort Worth called Overton Bank, and we're building a location in South Arlington. I didn't know Monty, um, but... Uh, a fellow that I had worked with uh, at Texas Commerce, had, he knew David Tapp, who was the president of Overton Bank in Fort Worth. And David had asked him if he knew any young bankers. Now, I was young at one period of time. I don't know how old I was at that time, but I was probably before, that was pre-40 and wanted to know if there were any young bankers that might be a good fit to start a bank in, in Arlington. So I uh, met with David at Walnut Creek Country Club with Monty. And, you know, you're used to interviewing and then they'll get back to you. You stare at the phone for five or six days. We're about 20 minutes into the meeting and he says, okay, when, when do you want to start? And I said, you're, you're hiring me? And he said, yeah. I had no idea that the building wasn't even built yet. <laughs> and, you know, I, so he said, and, you know, I accepted the job and he said, we're, you know, we bought the property. We want you to go through all the construction. I went through all that. We built the building one week before we were going to move in. And it was so cool because we rented a little retail space across the street, which still exists there. And this is the Matlock location. And I, I hired my young people that worked for me, tellers, personal bankers, administrative assistants. And every day we would go over and see the construction work that was being done. So we were building up this anticipation for this new location we were moving into. The week before I was gonna move into that location, Monty announced he was gonna go to work for Jim Helzer. So they offered me the job to come to Mansfield. So I never got to work in that location. <laughs> but it was one of the great decisions I've ever made in my life because it, when you made that decision to, oh, to come here, Lord. I mean, I went home that night. I, I mean, I knew Mansfield well, because as I said earlier, I did a lot of financing down here. I knew, I knew people down here. I remember when Dee was Tom's and Kent's administrative assistant. Uh, and, you know, so I knew Mansfield. I went home that night because everything at Overton, because you'd have to know David Tapp, everything was, we're making a decision. We're going forth. And so, you know, David met with me, said, I want you to come down to Mansfield. Mansfield and take over for Monty. Um, and so I said, sure, if that's what you want me to do. And I came down here. I went home that night and I said, honey, they want me to go run the bank in Mansfield. You know what she said? Where's Mansfield? 
And I said, well, it's just south of Arlington. You know, my wife worked in far north Dallas. She worked for Trammell Crow and Lincoln Properties, not at the same time, obviously. And she would get in the car and drive, you know, an hour and 15 yeah. minutes to work every day. She went north. She didn't know what was south down here. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that's how I ended up at, at Overton, which in 1997 was acquired by Frost. I will tell you, and I don't say anything negatively about any of the other banks. We have great bankers in this town. We really do. Um, but I would, I would never work. And I've had the opportunity to go to other banks. I've never worked for anybody but Frost. It's an incredible culture at that bank. And it comes from the top down. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's amazing. And I've enjoyed every minute of being there. I'm going to miss it. Uh, I, I, I've told people before, you know, usually when people retire, they've worked in downtown Dallas or they've worked in downtown Fort Worth. And chances are they may never even drive by their place of business. I'm going to drive by my place of business and look in that window. I've sat in the same chair. I told Katie the other day, I say I sat in the same chair, but actually I've worn about three of them out so we keep getting new chairs. But I've sat in that same chair for 28 years. And it's going to be tough driving by there. I mean, I'm going to miss these people. Good little Katie's going to be taking my place. She's outstanding. Uh, Nick Townsend sitting next to her is another young lender that's going to be working with us. And they're going to do an incredible job. But right now I'm in that process of uh, and of course, Brent, everybody knows Brent. I don't need to introduce Brent. Brent Brent's done a great job for us too, working with the small business mm -hmm. folks. Um, so it's being left in good hands, but for the next three or four months, it's the transition, mm -hmm. uh, taking these people out and introducing them to who my customers are, um, who, you know, they're, it, you know, when you, when you, I don't care if you're a banker, if you're a manufacturer, if you're a distributor, if you're a salesman, the relationships you have with your customers and your clients is what makes it. Uh, many, many, many of my customers are some of my best friends in the world. So uh, I've told all of them, I, I'm still going to come visit you in your business. I'll just be wearing shorts and flip flops. <laughs> so let me ask you a question um, in, in regards to the banking industry. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of changes. What are what are some of the things that you see? You know, I'm, I'm a kind of a future person. What do you see future wise when it comes to the banking industry? Well, that's a great question. Well, obviously, technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no there's no question that technology is changing it. And really, what you have to do, uh, you know, as much as as uh, everybody but the big banks, they 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 speak with disdain about the big banks, but really they're the leaders of what's going on. You can look at the Chases and the Wells Fargo's and the banks of America and see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not like it, but they're very visionary about what's going to happen. Um, I think we'll see technology continue to dominate banking. Um, a bank like Frost is gonna, in my opinion, is going to struggle a little bit with the fact that we believe very much in relationships one-on-one -on -one with people. As we move farther into the future, we're going to see more and more, and a lot of it is generationally driven. These young people, I mean, my son's a classic example. I don't think he's been inside of a bank in 15 years. He deposits his paycheck with his iPhone. He doesn't want to go in a bank. Um, you borrow money. Now, by calling customer service, and you know, they'll scan you the documents and you sign them and you, it, it, it I'm glad I'm getting out when I am, because <laughs> I'm very, I'm very relationship oriented. And that doesn't mean you can't still have relationships. I think one of the challenges to banks is to still continue to foster those relationships mm -hmm. without sitting across the desk. And the reason why I say a bank like Frost is going to, going to, probably continue to struggle a little bit that way is because we really work on that trusted advisor mentality. We want, and, and I don't know if you can foster that very well, unless you sit across the desk from somebody and really get to know them. Mm -hmm. What about money in general? No, no. Just money. Finance. I get so tired of seeing those crypto commercials <laughs> on TV. You know, God placed me in the right time in this world because this 70 year old, I'm probably, you know, I, I have fortunately have 
you know, long lines in my family. My dad passed away at 97 and my mom at 94. Um, I've got two brothers that are healthy as horses. It's 179, 175. So, you know, chances are I may live a little while longer, but I'm telling you right now, the whole crypto and doing everything through the internet is, I mean, I can't fathom it. It's just, I'm not smart enough to figure that stuff out. So that's where we're going though. Mm -hmm. That's where we're going. I think, you know, paper currency is probably going to be out of the system in yeah. five to 10 years. Well, they've been saying that for five years. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is just, you know, first of all, it's going to take the major financial institutions mm -hmm. to really embrace it. And that, I think that's been one of the big impediments to it. Okay. So in your career of banking, what would you, what advice would you give somebody? Not necessarily somebody in banking, but just in their career, in their life, or, or even a small business owner. What piece of advice based upon your experience would you give? Well, you know, I guess it, it's like I tell my three children, don't do anything that you're not passionate about. Now, here I am, a Civil War history guy that somehow got passionate about banking. But, you know, the thing about banking is pay, banking is not just transactional, oh, you know, I want to make a loan. I mean, I look around this community and I'm quite proud of what I've assisted my customers in doing. Uh, I'm telling you, the three individuals that you need to have if you're going to be a small business or any kind of business owner is you need to have a good attorney, you need to have a good CPA, you need to have a good banker. You need to have those people because that's the way you're going to get to where you need to be. Um, so, you know, I take a lot of pride in helping people realize their dreams. And so the advice I would give not only to young bankers, but to anybody is be passionate about that. Embrace that aspect of it. Don't just, I mean, you know, I've lived with, with lenders throughout my career that their whole motivation was, you know, did I meet my goals this year? And did I make enough loans or did I bring in enough deposits? Certainly that's a measure and accountability that we all have to have. But really the true value of it is how many deep relationships did you foster over the last year or, or in your career? I mean, I've got customers I've banked for 40 years. And I will tell you the value of that is they have had other banks offer them better deals, but they won't leave because of our relationship. relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's getting to ready to change. That's interesting. Hopefully not forever. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's always got to be that relationship. I mean, I, I know, I mean, I can't get into who my customers are, but I've got several of them here in town that, I mean, it's just literally they bring me in when they're making strategic decisions about their companies mm -hmm. because they know they need that advisor. And they also, I've sat in the room with, you know, attorneys and CPAs and it's, here's what my vision is. Can I get there? And with that core group of advisors, yeah, we, we can figure that out. We'll figure out a way to do that. So I wonder how that's going to continue to progress mm -hmm. if we continue to move away from that one-on-one -on -one relationship. Yeah. And I don't think that we will 100% if you think about it. I mean, it's not like we're going anywhere. No. <laughs> we're just going to have some Unless robots tools. take us over and Well, no, that's a possibility. Human race and, that's you know, a possibility. I, I read an article about that. <laughs> my son reads books about that. Yeah. It could be interesting. Yes. So um, what else? So I know you sit on quite a few boards. You do a lot of give back, volunteer time. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, what's, your, your, what's your advice on, on that piece of work? I'm, I'm glad you asked that because that, you know, that's, that's what I truly love. And, and I think it, it really boils down as much as anything to, uh, you know, I look at, at Mansfield. You know, I came here when Mansfield was on the cusp of really uh, growing. Uh, and, you know, I took the opportunity to get, I mean, I sat right here 
at this chamber it used to go upstairs. Is there anything up there? Anymore? No, that was that was next door. <laughs> oh, that was right. That, that was, was next door. door. That was yeah. next door. We used to have our board meetings upstairs up, up there. there yeah. uh, you know, I first got involved in the chamber. I, I was really active um, when I was still working in Arlington. I was in Rotary. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been in three different Rotary clubs, and and you know, one thing about being in service organization like that, it really fosters that need to give back to the community. And I know you're a, a strong Rotarian as well. And from that, you know, I was asked when you're in a position of leadership with a bank, you're asked to be on a lot of boards. And I used to always tell, I, I've turned down more opportunities to serve on boards because I wasn't really passionate about that. That doesn't mean that right. what you're doing isn't, isn't worthwhile. Right. I have to be really passionate about that. And I've, you know, as I've been chair of most of the boards I've been on. And the one thing I tell people when they're, when we're asking if they have an interest in being on the board is I tell them, do not get on this board if you're not passionate about it because you're not going to be an effective board member. So I, I've always, everything I've ever done, I've always been passionate about it. You know, obviously one of my great loves right now is the school district. I've been involved in the school district since, you know, I came here to town. Mr. Newsom uh, and I became very, very good friends. And he asked me to start the Education Foundation with him. And we did so. Um, and from that point on, I became very involved. I've always gone into the schools. Uh, you know, I've read to a number of different schools. I read at Roberta Tips pre-COVID. One of these days, I'll get back to doing that again. Um, I just, I love what we do. We've got an outstanding school district. And uh, it was when all of my children were through the school district that I decided that I would run. Dr. V had asked me if I would do so. Um, and that's been, that's been one of the most rewarding things I've done. I, I, me stepping off has nothing to do with, you know, any, anything going on with the school district good lord it's i hope we've left it a better place than when i got there it's an outstanding school where we got a great administration it's not just because our superintendent sitting in the room <laughs> um, and and you know the last couple of years have been difficult mm -hmm. and challenging but i wouldn't i wouldn't change a thing about what we did now there were a couple of things where because we were feeling our way in the dark that, you know, we would do over, but the corrective action we took remedied the problem. That's the way life's going to be. We're all going to stub our toes sometimes. Absolutely. And we just, it's how you react to that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's why I say, you know, at the end of the day, we did the right thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, make a point, and I know you would make this point as well, that the correlation between the community service um, and the relationship building and business, that those three work together. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's one of the things that we always try to tell people when they come into the chamber is that that's the best thing that you can do. Find what you're, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you. You have to find yeah. what you're passionate about. Um, otherwise you're not gonna enjoy it and it's gonna be a beat down for yeah. you, but. Um, well, and that, I mean, that brings to mind something you know, as a Rotarian, we're always recruiting new yes. Rotary members. <laughs> the first thing I tell anybody is don't do this because you want to build business relationships. Right. That'll be a it's byproduct. Not a networking That'll be yeah. a byproduct. And I have I have never gone into a Rotary meeting, even with cards in my pocket. No. But when they see the type of person yes. you are, they'll want to do business with right. you. Right. And that's leadership. Yep. Right? Yep. So we're at our 30 minute mark. I know they Seems are dying. Like just about five. I'm, I know. They're dying to ask you questions. So they are. They are. <laughs> I know they are. See, they have hands, they're like ready. So I'm gonna, we're gonna say goodbye to Facebook and um, and then we're gonna I think my wife's class is actually watching this. So oh, so you can give a shout out. Hey honey. So my wife teaches fashion and interior design. So this really did. Oh, it was riveting. <laughs> They're sitting there sewing smocks. They're like, oh. Listening. 
Okay. Bye, Facebook.